ओके सर वी कैन स्टार्ट ओके हाय फ्रेंड्स वेलकम यू टू द ऑन कोर्स दिस इज द सेकंड सेशन ऑफ द ऑन डेवलप बेस डेवलपमेंट कोर्स in the earlier session we covered uh, a good introduction to arm architecture family and then how arm core uh, sells their ips to other ip manufacturers and uh, uh, the vendors make the chips based on the arm core and they build their product around it arm also supplies not only the architecture core it also supplies all the tools compiler assembler and the debugging tools for the vendors to purchase the core and build the system the system on a chip soc and use the arm software to change to build a end product now in this session we will be covering a little bit about ndns and the conditional flags that are available in in, in general in any processor and in specific to arm we will be covering in this lecture so this is the detailed plan for this session 2 we will know though we call claim that arm is a risk based design there are some deviations and we will see why there are some deviations and what are their advantages and we will just touch upon embedded system hardware and software because arm is built for this market and we should have a clear idea of where where arm is used and how the software developed for the arm runs on the embedded system now to understand the architecture of any processor the basic requirement is that people should know how the processor is used at the end in a system so as a developer most of us will be writing in a high level language like c or c++ or java could could be but what do we need to know Processor architecture and assembly language. The reason being, if you know the architecture and how it runs and how it executes its own instructions, then we will be a better programmer to write our software either in high-level languages like C or C++. Or uh, there, there are some critical part piece of code is there which needs to be developed in assembly that could be done also and integrated with the C++ or one or two of code. So having a good idea of the software tool chain and how various tools work together to develop a build and executable and run it on a hardware is very very important to be a successful embedded software engineer for embedded hardware designer so both the hardware and software meet in this embedded world so people who are in this area to have a good knowledge on both to be a successful engineer so my intent here to give you a overview of the embedded hardware and software we are not going to detail of this but it will give you some flavor and which will help uh, you to understand the processor architecture features and how they map on to the hardware or software part of it and then we will go into the details of stack where this is most important part of any programming paradigm so let us see uh, how stack is implemented in arm and uh, the indianness is also a very critical piece of uh, information that all of us should be aware of and of course the condition force when you do an arithmetic operation what are the uh, results of that and how to interpret them is the most important thing uh, as well so let us see uh, how arm deviates from a pure risk design if you recall from the earlier session risk processes are fixed instruction size and they every instruction runs in a single cycle and they have plenty of registers to operate on and all the arithmetic operations work on only register operands and most of the instructions run in single cycle this is what we learned about risk but that is not true um, uh, in arm some of the deviations are then for some reason one is to make sure that arm is suitable for embedded applications because finally the arm has to be used in some embedded applications to be successful in the market and the designer has thought about that and took some deviations from the risk 
phenomena to incorporate what is needed for embedded application. The most important thing is that whatever the code it generates from the other compiler from the assembler, it needs to be no small form uh, footprint that it occupies less number of bytes so that it can be put into a small ROM or flash without occupying too much of space in the embedded hardware. So that you know, we save space as well as we say we build up materials for the hardware. So apart from that ARM process also includes some high level application specific instructions too and also it needs to support real time OS. I will tell you what are the instructions that are there, but we will go into the details of them when we study about individual instructions of ARM. So as I said risk is a very you know single cycle instructions most of them, but some of the ARM instructions are variable cycle cycle execution it takes variable number of cycles for some of the instructions. And one of the example is that load store multiple instruction which is actually helping you to store multiple register contents into memory or recover multiple contents multiple 32 by 32 bit values from the memory into registers. So single instruction takes more cycles based on number of registers are there in them. And swap instruction is another example where your memory read and write happen one after the other without any break in cycle. So if the memory cycle takes more number of instruction cycles then it could be a few uh, instruction cycles to complete this cycle. But why is it required? It is required for supporting semaphore kind of operation. We will talk about that when we uh, come to the SAP instructions in the electric section. And some more is another system bit mode of ARM where the code instruction bit is instead of 32 bit it is a 16 bit and conditional execution is another feature where every instruction assembly instruction are executed based on the status of a particular conditional path. So at this moment I do not want you to know about everything what they mean but you need to be aware that though we claim ARM is a pure risk there are some deviations to support the embedded application environment. Now just briefly touch upon what is inside an embedded system. You might have seen uh, so many examples of embedded system and I could say if you are entering into an office and there is an access card in the you are having a um, ID and you are swiping that at the door. So it is an embedded system where it reads your card and understands whether who is the person coming into the office and then it sends the data to a particular central server and verifies that you are the person and you have the credibility and access permissions to enter the office then it actuates the door lock so that you can open the door and come into the office. So to do this a system like this is required it needs to sense when you swipe the card and that information what it reads from the card has to be processed by the CPU and then it needs to send it to the central server through a Ethernet port or maybe a IO port and then verify that you have access permission to the office and then actuate the door logs so that it allows you to enter the office. So this is typically a, a example where a spot of the code is written to understand the card what is the contents of the card and then send it to the server and get it back. So in this case the embedded system needs to be reliable and it uh, should operate on a minimum power because it should not be up, uh, consume, consuming more power to operate and there are so many restrictions and conditions for this software to work reliably. One example would could be that suppose there is uh, emergency then the door should be people should be able to unlock the door and exit from the office. So this kind of even it should be able to handle and reliably that is very important. Now 
some of the requirements that a CPU which could be ARM and it should be able to read the sensors from the environment and it should be able to actively actuate the, the you know different server relays or any other uh, control engines or motors or whatever and then it should be reliable and fault tolerant and this is a very important whenever you see embedded system they say that it should be able to you know, even if it fails if there should be a graceful degradation you know the even if suppose the access card of the office has failed it should fail in such a way that it keeps it you know if it is to a, a locker room maybe it should keep the door locked uh, where uh, very confidential in, uh, documents are kept or if it is to an office maybe if there is an emergency people should be able to come out so you should uh, make sure that the door is kept in the open uh, state uh, during the failure. So, this kind of things need to be taken care of in the real time system and the real time system could be say you know type control to a car engine control to radar or even a pacemaker which is uh, you know very kind of body. So, it should be so reliable and it should be able to react very fast these are the requirements and the person develops right you now uh, developing a designing a processor for this kind of environment we need to make sure that it supports all those features as well as as a programmer embedded designer we need to be very cautious about what we write how we write our code so that our software runs most reliably in the embedded system. And this is a typical example of embedded system where ARM processor could be there and then it is connected to memory to a memory controller and then it could be connected to a serial port or to a ethernet to a central server and then we have other peripherals to keep the system running. And our code what we develop is running here and the whole thing is powered by the power system industry. Now let us go talk about embedded system software. How do you develop an embedded system software? Uh, it could be any software, but we are very particularly concentrating on uh, developing software for embedded system. Here, the first step is to write a software, and it could be a C file or C plus plus file or an assembly file, and it goes through a compiler and assembler based on what is the input that is given to those tools, and then they are linked using a linker. There may be a library files provided by the processor developer vendor or the tool vendor to a processor and then the output is loaded into the particular memory as a or memory then the CPU starts and it starts executing this code. Now this is the order then let us see what these individual tools do to make our executable running. Take an example of a C code here. I have given you a small two in set no line. One count variable is there, which is of type integer, and we are interested in it. Now, when we compile the C code, this part of this source file or uh, instruction gets expanded to this many assembly instructions. As you see, I have given the ARM instructions here because this is a C compiler meant for ARM. So, it is compiling the C code and generating a ARM assembly. Now, if suppose if you are using an Intel processor and then you are compiling, the, you are having a compiler for the Intel processor, it will compile the high level language code that you have written and then generate Intel specific instructions here. So, compilers are always specific to which processor you are compiling the source code for. Now, there is another uh, part of it, also you remember that the compiler could be running on PC or Windows PC or it could be running on a Unix system or it could be on a Mac. So, compiler asset is running on any of these operating systems and then generating for a particular target processor. So, if suppose if you are running the same code in the same platform then the compiler is meant for that particular platform that is when I say platform it could be a Windows or a Unix platform. But when you are developing a compiling a code for ARM and then you are trying to run this code on an ARM processor development board or embedded system, then you are not running it on the PC, but you are running the executable on a target hardware. Then that kind of a platform is called crash platform because you are compiling it on one platform and then develop, you know, generating an executable which is meant for running it on the target platform. 
you the code that you develop, you know, generate here cannot run on the PC that you are having because PC could be an Intel based PC or the AMD processor running there. So this code can run on only the ARM processor. So that is what it means by cross compiling the you know, C compiler runs the uh, compiles the code and then generates the OBJ file. Now OBJ file is understandable by the tools, but for a human being to read and understand what exactly this OBJ file means, we need to give a, a special option there, maybe minus s or some option based on the tool to generate assembly code to see what exactly instructions it has put in. So let us not go and try to understand this instruction. Now you will be spending a lot of time in understanding the assembly code in the coming courses in the coming sessions. What I want you to remember that you know we should be comfortable with reading through assembly. That is the first important criteria for uh, taking up a course like this. But you will find it very interesting, and uh, you know there is an analogy to begin from C and how it converts to, you know gets converted to assembly it will be a very interesting part of this course. Now, after this OBJ file is generated, you may have multiple source files, and then you want to generate only EXT file. Then an inter is required to mess them off and then generate the EXT code. So this is the flow of a C program. Let us uh, see how the C program finally gets converted to executable, and then it runs on the target hardware. Now this is the typical memory space of uh, ARM processor, where there is some part of the memory. This is the memory which is outside the processor and the CPU is accessing this memory through address bus and data bus. So this memory is split into multiple spaces code, data and heap and stack. We will see what each of them mean. Uh, you can make out that code is for whatever executable that you have made that the code part of it will sit here and then if you have a initialized data that will sit in this portion and then we will see why stack and heap are there for your program to run. Now, as we are given a small C code, you do not have to understand what is actually this planning you know, is being you know, done. The thing is, here two functions are called one is accepting, a, both are accepting integer variables and then they increment it. Do not bother about what they do with the incremented value, but just to give you a flavor of how a C code gets run on the hardware, that is the intent of this particular um, slide. Now, in this portion, you know, we have uh, some memory is reserved for stack. Now, you see, now what happened is the program is loaded but not running. Now, what happened is you use the loader to load the executable in the memory. Now, this is the core part of the executable, and this is the data portion of the uh, initialized data portion of the uh, program that you have written, which is loaded into the memory. We could use know uh, different uh, tools like the tag or any other tool to download your software into a hard you know the memory uh, it could be you can assume that this is a, a development board which could which is ARM based and it has got a memory space like this and then you are downloading the code into this memory. Now let us see when you start running this code the execution as you know any C program starts executing from main. Now you may wonder how will this processor know that the main code is sitting in this particular address. So that is the job of a library which is given by ARM or any other processor vendor uh, so that when you write a C code and we put a main then the control comes to this main and then the processor starts running from that instruction. Now when it comes here you know that the static variable as well as the global variables are already there. I am not showing the initialized value here only the variables where they are placed in the memory. Now the control is here what does it mean is the PC the program counter of the CPU is pointing here actually when it is pointing at this point place it is pointing at the instructions the assembly instructions which uh, have been generated by the compiler <coughs> understanding this C code. Uh, so when the control now is here you, you can see that these variables are placed here and the local variable which is created here the main is also placed in stack. So I will explain more about stack now you can now for that moment you can understand that any local variables are placed in stack. Now let us see what happens now. Now after when the control goes into the function the 
local variable uh, as a parameter here is also generated a space is created for it so stack is going downwards as you see that it is going downwards and then generating space for the new variables that need to be created based on the control flow. Now after executing from this function it comes back to the main and then it is about to enter the function to here. So as you see when it comes back the space reserved for j is gone. So you know the variable j is no longer in the visibility now and it is not there the space created for it is also uh, gone. Now again when this function 2 is called it goes into this function and then generates k variable uh, place for space for k in the stack space and then control comes here when it is in the main is still the int variable i is visible so that uh, stack space is uh, still not gone and then when the program exists the stack is has come back to the old state. But you may wonder why it is executable and the variables are sitting here because that job of a OS or maybe some other tool to take care that this code is removed and some other executable code. So I have not shown it that uh, that is why this is not removed. So when the program is running only there is a life for the program and then there are variables around and then when it is standing sitting at a code it occupies space in the memory but it does not have any state associated with that. So this is a simple example of how a program C program or any other high level language program that you have developed for a processor and how it runs on a the development tool the hardware. Okay, now let us see how stack I told you that stack grows and, and then again shrinks based on the need. Now this is a typical example which I have taken from this uh, on a social architecture book. This is similar to what I have shown you earlier. So only difference here is the function one is calling function two again, and then function two it goes into function two now. So as you see, at a different point in time, if at here t one it has just not even called into gone into function one, and when it is inside function one at t two the stack is used for the function one, and then in t three when it function two function one calls another function two, the stack is going down again. Because you may wonder why is the depth is more here or less here that based on the amount of space that is required for local variable or parameters in the individual functions the stack grows accordingly. So the size is increasing as the depth of the function calls increase and then when they come back from the function to here at T4 this space is released and then when it comes back to main at T5 even the place space reserved for function 1 is gone. So this is a kind of uh, uh, stack space growing and coming down coming down and it has the flow of the program. Now why am I talking too much about stack? This is very important because every processor needs to support a stack implementation because as you all are aware every program has a some subroutines and then parameters and any high level language needs local variables, space for local variables, all those things reside in stack. So, a stack is a lot of out, that means what you put into the stack loss will be the first one you will take into it. But that does not mean that you cannot access the other elements in the stack, but if you know the location of other variables in the stack, you will be able to access them from the stack and operate on them. Only thing is, you no. Know, when you come out of a function, all the variable space is gone, but you will be able to access all the variables which are inside the stack in a function without any restrictions. Because you are accessing the stack by using the memory addresses of each of the variables that are occupied by those variables in the stack. As I showed you about i and j and k variables in the stack. So this the stack provides space for local variables. And then whenever a, a function is called a new frame is created as you saw in the previous diagram that it went down by a fixed amount based on the number of local variables and the um, parameters being passed. So when they come out of the stack they lose you know release the space. Now let us see that as I told you every processor needs to uh, support 
the track pointer. So the R setting is the register which is used for pointing at the address where the current top of the stack is found. So this is normally used and is the convention that R13 is the name of the register in the processor. We will talk about it more in the subsequent lecture. And, uh, and so R13 uses you know for stack monitor here. And then whenever the data item is pushed, R13 is incremented or decremented based on how the stack grows. And then when the value is removed, the stack R13 is uh, not bad. Now we also have heap. This is the data area stack is based on the local variable and parameters for the function and this is um, um, heap is used for any memory that you need for a program dynamic memory allocation using ML or for P. this you would have heard about in your T program uh, courses. So, the heap space is used for this purpose and they also grow based on the need and um, based on the program requirement and whenever the envelope is used that particular space is allocated and then when it is free the space is uh, freed up and the program cannot use those points as well. And then stack space is typical in a ARM space uh, ARM programming environment stack and I am going back in the slide stack goes downwards in the memory and the heap goes upward in the towards the memory towards each other. So, these are all dynamic requirement of memory of a program based on the usage and uh, when they meet each other that means there is a space crunch and the program point after that. Okay. So, this is the heap space which is required for a dynamic memory allocation and then minimum runtime library is used as I mentioned in the earlier case uh, how uh, ARM processor or any processor knows that there is a main program starting in the memory. So, that kind of support is required you know we do not want the developers to you know write the code for ML or something. So, these kind of uh, um, free memory uh, library functions are already implemented for a particular processor and given along with the tool uh, along with assembler and linker and compiler the library for implement which is implementing these functions are also provided there. and even to start a program the entry to the main is also um, some program is uh, sort of code is given along with the library and then if there is a um, heap and stack space are interfacing you know, interfering with each other that limit is also verified by uh, software functions and then there are other additional functions also provided along with the library. Now, let us see how stack is implemented in a processor. The address to be used to store a data value in a stack is not known at the time of the program, right. So, stack is usually implemented in a linear memory space. As I told you, that stack can grow, but it can have two options either it can grow in a towards a higher address or it could grow towards a lower address. So, both options are available in ARM though some typical processor may implement it in hardware and then support it in only one and one good example is a uh, 86 family where the process the stack is always going towards the loyal memory and uh, it is specific to the particular implementation of a hardware implementation of the processor. Now, as I told you R13 is one of the registers which is used for pointing at the location which is the top of the stack. Now, there are two options available either it can point to a place where the already a value is stored in the stack or it could be pointing at the place where empty space is there. So, I will give you an example here this is for ascending and full that means the stack is growing towards ascending uh, that is mean higher address and the stack pointer is pointing at location in the stack which is full already is filled with some item and now when the next stack operation is done on this we can imagine how it will move. So, it has to it is ascending so it has to move towards a higher address 
and then where will the next item push would be in the memory here will it be here or here as I told you stack rows contiguous space so it has to be in the next location so in this address now what happens when another push or another uh, data item is pushed to the stack the pointer moves to this location and another item is pushed to that. Now what happens to uh, ascending an empty this is uh, implementation where the R30 is pointing to the empty location. So this is you know very specific to a process of now which is better uh, you know you can follow any convention uh, because you can see that the number of operations that are done to push an item into the stack is the same because either you increment the pointer uh, after pushing this uh, item or you increment it before pushing the item. So based on whether it is pointing at an empty location or the uh, full location the incrementing of what needs to be done anyway for every push operation. So uh, either it is incrementing or decrementing is also uh, it takes the same cycle as far as the architecture is concerned. But uh, it is a implementation specific and uh, we can do it in any way. But ARM processor, as I told you, this ARM is like a IP core. So you know, ARM is integrated with any other processor. They have provided all the options so that um, when it is integrated with a particular uh, another core, it could be from another uh, the processor uh, or it could be working for a particular application. Then, based on the need, the IP core can be configured to uh, program the stack in any. Way. So in this case ascending empty when the next item is pushed it pushes to this location and then it again points to an empty location. Now what happens when a pop is done that means when you are taking out an item it, it has to decrement the R13 and then take the item out and then point keep pointing at the empty location. So whatever was done for putting a data the reverse has to be done in the same way. Now there is another way of implementing it which is towards the lower addresses which is descending and full. It is pointing at a full location where the item is already there and then it is going to be decremented to push another item into it. The fourth option would be very simple. Now you can see that this is the descending and empty. Now you may wonder when the processor is coming up uh, in a research location what is the stack it follows. So, there are some instructions uh, push and pop specific to the stack and uh, they assume uh, descending and full uh, you know this configuration as a default and then to be used in any way and ARM has given different instructions for uh, you know they all these four types of stack. Now let us see how ARM who decides you know which type of stack to be used. In ARM it is decided by the programmer or controller or assembler by choosing a suitable instruction. So, but the thing is we once we decide on a particular implementation for the whole application it should be the same. We cannot assume we cannot use one instruction which assumes empty and uh, descending and then while taking the data out you assume that you use the instruction which is meant for uh, ascending and full then what you push you may not be getting it from that. So, the flexibility is there but needs to be taken. Uh, with a pinch of salt and we need to make sure that assembly, the writer especially if you are writing a assembly code you, you know you remember that you are using a proper uh, code for both pushing and popping the values into the stack and putting the data from there. So, this also supports multiple register transfer instructions and you could uh, use the any of the four type of stack for that. Now, as I told you we can while storing and retrieving the data we need to have a same set of same type of instructions to be used and then these are the instructions which operate on you know stack pointer which are related to stack pointer and we will talk about these uh, instructions in the subsequent lecture. Okay, now we have talked about stack now let us see what is Indian that means. All of you have heard about big Indian and big Indian. Now take an example. A CPU is there and there is a register inside the CPU. We always consider 32 bit content because we are talking about ARM 7 and which is a 32 bit uh, register inside. So, this is typically a 32 bit register, these are the bits 0 to 7 and 24 to 31, and these are the values given in exadecimal. Now, there are two ways in which a register content can be saved in a memory. 
See the memory that we use there is a byte addressable memory. That means you save you every uh, unit of memory, memory location is byte, is a by bit of byte. So address of person one is pointing at a one. Uh, maybe I should have thousand and uh, one two three. I will be same here. So because it should be aligned to zero for a better um, reading and writing. So I think that the address is a thousand and then uh, one and two three or the other addresses. Then from the higher, you know, the MSB part of the register is stored in the first location and then as the increasing addresses the other bytes are stored. Now this is one way of storing it this is called big Indian model and then in little Indian what we do the processor does is it takes the, the, the lower byte of the register and then that it saves in the addresses. So uh, starting from this address and towards the increasing address it stores the from starting from this byte. Now which one is better there is uh, no concrete rule that you know this could be for better than the other one but there are some applications that I will tell you how these two are different and how which is useful but it is uh, specific to a particular part of implementing. So these names are called as big and big names you do not want to remember that big means that if you see the particular register value which has more uh, content because this higher bit byte is having a more value right. So compared to the LSD bits. So this is stored first then it is called big Indian if the, the lower bytes are stored first it is called a little Indian. Now let us see let us have a uh, one question here and I suggest you um, please the presentation and then try to answer this before seeing the option which is correct. So in this question what we are trying to say is it suppose a CPU is writing a register content it wrote in a big Indian mode can it read back that memory content into a register in a little Indian mode if, if it does which are options are correct will the new content in the register will be different from what was written or the content will be the same irrespective of what engineers is used or the content may be same or different you are not sure whether it may be the same or different. The fourth option is NDNS may not be the same while writing and reading the contents into the memory. So multiple options could be correct I want you to think for a while and choose one of them before seeing the correct uh, answer to this question. Option A is correct the reason being if the value what is there in the register was written in one Indian name and if it is not written in the same way you will be seeing a reversal of what was written. So effectively if you are writing into a memory in between here you better read it in the big Indian mode. Uh, if you are writing it in little Indian then read it in little Indian mode. So then only you will get the correct value in the register back. Now let us see how different processors in the market implement this NDN. So this is these are the product processors from different companies use the big Indian mode of saving values from register to memory and these processors do a little Indian way of saving it. There are some processors our arm is also here it supports both. Now why a processor like ARM needs to support both? As I told you, ARM is a, a IP core which is given to different processor vendors to make build their system along with ARM core. So there is a requirement, maybe application specific, or it could be tied to a, another processor which is there in the system, and ARM is part of it. So ARM should be able to come support both the NDNS so that. Uh, in a multiprocessor environment if some other processor from this family is used in a, in a single board and ARM is part of it and then you should understand the big Indian of way of writing and reading from the memory. But if ARM is part of any of these processor family then you should understand the little Indian 
Okay, so it is configurable and power on, and even it could be changed while the program is running. But need to be very careful when you know uh, what you store. The NDNS used for a storing a value is used to read it back, so that you the correctness of the program and the correctness of data that is read from the memory is achieved. Now, what are the advantages, if at all, in any one of the modes? In big Indian way, it is easier to determine the sign of an number. As you know, in a typical binary representation, the sign bit is at the MSB, the 31 bit, 31 is the sign bit. So, if you remember, big Indian stores the higher part of the byte first in the memory. So, you can just read the first byte of the value and then easily find out whether it is positive or negative based on the sign bit value. So, it is easier in terms of big Indian uh, if it is followed and easy to compute compared to numbers because the value if it is an unsigned number and you see that the some of the higher bits are 1 that means that value is more than some which are having 0. So, if you start comparing the bits from the higher end you will be able to compare to numbers and division also starts from the top. So, it is easier in big Indian and it is easier to print because we read it from MSB value suppose 4028 the 4 may be part of the higher part of the binary representation. So, please do not understand you know please conclude do not conclude that it, you know these operations cannot be done in this way. It is only easier in this implementation, but both are equally good in terms of um, supporting other features and uh, paired multiplication is uh, multiple multiplication precision numbers are easier in between. So, let us now jump into other important area of processor architecture which is arithmetic condition codes. All of you might have seen and might be aware of this I thought I will take a amount of time in this course to make sure that the understanding of these flags are very very well understood. So, that maybe in the subsequent letters we could proceed further without any problem. So, let us start with the explanation for each other flag just to have a continuity 0 flag as you are aware any arithmetic operation if it results into 0 then this flag is set in a sign flag all of you may be aware of I am sure you are aware of sign magnitude form or a two complement form in any form any way the MSB bit is meant for a sign bit. So, if that is set the sign flag is set and the carry flag is you suppose you uh, two binary numbers are added and if there is a overflow from there the carry flag is set and overflow flag is little different from carry flag I would like to make use of this presentation to remove any doubts in these two flags. So, overflow flag is meant for sign that is meant. let us see how they differ in the subsequent place. Please go through this question here. We are saying that there are four flags in the system. Control flags are there. This is negative, and this is zero, and this carry and overflow flag. Suppose if it is a four-bit array in you, and then it is performing a four-bit arithmetic. I want each one of you to prepare uh, a presentation and then spend one minute or two minutes to do this, and then see which of the flags are set are cleared and then choose one of the options based on what you think is the right option. Now, the correct option is this. Now, let us see how these flags are set when these bits are added. Now, the same problem I have given here, these numbers are the same. Let us try to interpret these numbers what they mean. As I told you, this is a 4 bit number, this could be extended to 8 bit or 16 bit by just simply copying this sign bit to all the higher bit positions. So, whatever you understand from 4 bit is applicable to 8 bit or 16 bit or 32 bit I think also. Now, I want you to fill these values for each of this. If it is unsigned, it will correspond to 30 because you will consider this to be a 8 plus 4 plus 1, but if it is a sign value how do you convert it? 
is it a negative number or a positive number? Because this MSB, because it's a four bit, remember that. So this is a MSB bit. If it is one, it is a this is a signed bit actually. So it is a negative value. So all of you are aware in and uh, maybe I not mentioned it. You now in this processor, especially ARM processor and most of the processors use two complement as the representation for signed number. So in this case, it is representation two complement. So how do you convert this into a negative number? What is this uh, correspond to? It is it corresponds to so minus three. How do we do that? You complement all these bits and add one. What you get is three. That is because this MSB is one. You put a minus three here. Now similarly, you do this also. You will get eleven and minus five. Now when you when we add these numbers, either it is added as an unsigned number or it could result in a signed value. Now, just do a binary arithmetic, you will get this value. Now, I want you to see which are the flags are set based on this. I am saying here 0 is clear, why the result is not completely 0, all 4 bits are not 0, so 0 flag needs to be clear because the result is not 0. Now why should the carry flag be set? All of you have done arithmetic and arithmetic you would have seen that there is a carry flag going out of this addition. So it is quite natural that this carry flag is set in this addition. Now what does it mean? Carry flag is set means this unsigned arithmetic cannot be uh, accommodated within the four bit because you know the 13 plus 11 cannot be accommodated because maximum what you can accommodate in the four bit is 15. So, it cannot be. So, the carry flag is set, that means it is an unsigned overflow. Now, you see here the overflow flag is clear, whereas time bit is 1 because this is 1 and 0 is already 0, you are seeing that, and overflow flag is clear, that means the signed arithmetic can be represented in this fourth bit, which is minus 8. Now, how do we know most of the meta? got it right or some of you might have got it wrong this overflow flag how it is set let us see how it is done ok. The answer is here correct and uh, here you see that this answer is correct and this is wrong. Now the explanation for overflow flag is that it indicates whether the signed result the signed arithmetic after the operation can be fit into the available bit or not. Here V is clear because minus it can be accommodated within 4. Now let us see how it is computed. In a typical hardware, when you do arithmetic, if it is a 4 bit arithmetic, this is MSB and MSB on the 1 bit which is closer you know, next to the MSB is also considered a carry flag, carry coming from this addition is also taken as an input apart from this carry. Now these two carries are XR to come up with a overflow um, flag. So this is the way overflow is flag is set. Now anyway this corresponds to the correct value, but you know this is a way to see whether overflow flag will be set or not. Now let us see one more example where you see that the overflow flag is set here. So take an example, I I want you now because having seen the previous example you should be able to fill these values and then the result as including these flags and then you can check whether what you get in your computation is same or not and if there is a misunderstanding maybe that will you can clear it here. Now all of you might have got it right this both the values and either it is signed or unsigned value both are same because MSB is 0. So both are positive numbers so it can be interpreted the same way. Now this results in 10 whereas let us see why did we say the signed value is minus 6? Now we have to see that the difference in interpreting the number whether it is signed or unsigned is different. In unsigned we consider this also a, a positive value and then we say 2 to the power 3 here and then add this value to 8 plus 2 10 whereas if it is interpreted as a signed value we consider it is a negative number and then we do the extract this number from a choose complement representation how to represent and now get the minus 6 value. Now if you do the arithmetic and then apply the XOR operation that I told you in the previous slide 
you will be able to get the values of overflow class. Now you see that overflow that is set here. Okay, so the result what you got turn the three is ten. In find the representation here, you can go up to seven. You can't represent more than seven in a sign representation and uh, what you are getting is minus 6 it is not 10 so it is not interpreted as 10 so overflow flag is 10. So basically overflow flag gives you a indication that whether signed arithmetic was then properly or not whether you can interpret the result correctly or not. In this case if overflow flag is set what you have here as a result for overflow and arithmetic is wrong. So, this is uh, signed arithmetic and these numbers are interpreted as unsigned overflow flag is irrelevant whereas if it is signed this overflow flag is to be considered. Now, how signed and unsigned numbers are interpreted? If it is in a C program you may write signed int or unsigned int and based on the variable either it is a global or local it is allocated by the compiler in either data segment or stack segment and then when the arithmetic operation is to be performed the variable contents are copied to registers and operation is performed into the CPU. Now when the CPU is performing the operation it does not know whether it is operating on a sign value or unsigned value. So, it is it depends on the programmer or the compiler it knows when a particular variable is move it knows whether it is declared as a signed integer or unsigned integer and then it looks at a proper flag whether it looks at carry flag or overflow flag to see whether the result what was you know got after the arithmetic operation was correct or not. So, this is the way and signed and unsigned and signed integers are handled in a processor. So, I assume to these are the various conditional code and um, you know we will talk about this in the subsequent lecture, um, but these are the flags which are checked for particular condition whether it is equal or not equal or whether unsigned lower or same. So, I ask you to verify whether these flags are correct uh, based on this condition and uh, which will make your understanding better. So, in this lecture what we have seen is to risk design and then how they are represented in embedded software and we touched upon embedded hardware and software and then we saw stack implementation in ARM and we touched upon NDMS as well as the condition force. So, uh, we will be having some last sections associated with this uh, to give you some exercise on how to interpret this flag and whether Suppose in a program, if you are put if i is greater than n or equal to j, if both un, i and j are unsigned, then which is the comparison we need to do? Unsigned higher or unsigned higher or same. This is the instruction or this is the condition needs to be set. That means carry has to be set if it is true. The value that you are comparing. If two values which are being compared are unsigned then this is then if suppose two values which are compared are signed then one of these conditions are checked. You can see that overflow flag is seen wherever there are signed operands are compared and then you see the carry flag is used where there are unsigned operands are there. Now, you may have a question whether can we compare an unsigned number with a signed number that is wrong. We should not be doing a com comparing uh, unsigned and unsigned because it is like comparing a and So, um, we will see how these comparisons are used in the assembly programming and how does compiler uses these comparisons according to the variables that you are using. So, what you need to understand now is that how these comparisons correspond to these flags and if you understand this then you know in the subsequent lectures when we talk about branch based on conditions or um, after the arithmetic operation there is a overflow or not when you are comparing those flags 
Understanding of this will make your programming easier. And if you need to write assembly code, it is very, very imperative and important that you understand these tags without any doubts. So, I think we are through with this session. I hope you understood the basic concept that I have tried to explain here. And in subsequent lectures, also we will be touching upon this concept, but this understanding will help you to uh, understand the um, subsequent lectures as well as the instructions which are coming up in the ARM architecture, uh, we will be able to understand this well. And thank you very much for your time and hope to see you in the next section. Have a nice day.